GIF gang, yes, it is Friday. And all I have to say today is today you are you. That is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. Oh, I suppose I could say the daily dope is in the air. <laughs> Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I am back once again. I am Jeff McAleer. I am your host here at The Daily Dope, as well as the Grand Poobah of TheGamingGang.com. Welcome aboard. Today is Friday, March 2nd. And I'm sure maybe one or two of you out there did catch my reference to Dr. Seuss to open the show today. Yes. Dr. Seuss was born on this day back in 1904. Oh, that is quite a ways back, isn't it? Little known fact about Dr. Seuss is that, and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who knows, who knows, duh, who know that Dr. Seuss did work in commercial art and he did work on advertisements and things like that. But a lot of people don't realize that Dr. Seuss was also an illustrator for the army, doing army propaganda prior to, and I believe early on in World War II. Pretty wild. All right, so I've got a pretty big show today. Not a ton of news. I only have four news items, but I will be reviewing Songbirds from Homo Sapiens Lab and Daily Magic games and for some strange reason when i was talking about this yesterday i kept referring to the game as song bird now it's song birds plural not singular jeff i do want to mention chat is available it's just not on screen but there is chat available through twitch as well as youtube as usual so i do have some news i've got some opinion that i'm gonna share Nothing crazy, don't worry, I'm not gonna get everybody up in arms. Like when I was talking about, yes, you should go and sue <laughs> Palladium Books over their uh, Robotech RPG Tactics Kickstarter fiasco. But yes, I do have a little bit of opinion to share with you today. So, uh, it's Friday, probably a little shorter than uh, some of the past shows. I know the past couple of shows have run over an hour and a half. Pretty wild. All right, without further ado, let's jump into the news because there is a 4X science fiction game that's on the horizon, which really does look pretty interesting. And I have the dope on Empires of the Void 2 from Red Raven Games. The Kuros Empire emerged from the deep, endless pool of space, dark and undetectable. They crushed Earth's paltry fleet within a week and broke through the great planetary shield that protected the surface. Bright blue oceans turned to an irradiated wasteland as they bombarded the planet, shredding the remnants of thousands of years of human history. Markin, last captain of Earth's forces, made a final desperate attempt to survive, salvaging an abandoned world ship from hundreds of years past. She took command and headed for the fringe of the galaxy, 
or there was a chance to gain a foothold, grow in strength, and find new allies for the fight against the Kuros. Earth's longtime enemies, the Zun, Zun maybe, and the Sima empires soon followed in their own world ships, leaving behind decimated worlds and lost families, determined to stake their own claim on the fringe. In Empires of the Void 2, you have been given a mission to establish a foothold at the fringe of the galaxy for your galactic empire. The game begins when your massive world ships reach the fringe, where you must explore, wage war, use diplomacy, and construct buildings to gain victory. The fringe is sparsely populated, and the few local sentient species are struggling to survive, leaving huge regions of planets open for exploration and colonization. Many species are eager to ally themselves with a powerful empire to gain security and stability in a chaotic and difficult time. As you explore and interact with planets, you will discover unfolding stories of the fringe. Each inhabited planet is home to a unique alien species with their own goals, values, and problems. Will you give aid by fighting off pirates, transporting goods, and curing strange diseases? Or will you invade and rule with a cruel hand? That's right, rule with an iron fist. This may be your last chance to prepare before the Kuros meet you again. Empires of the Void is for 2-5 to five players ages 13 and up and plays in around 30 minutes per player. The game is actually available right now and it does carry an MSRP of $79.98. Cents. Don't know where they came up with the 98 cents over at Red Raven Games. This does look interesting. I have to be honest, I don't know anything really about Red Raven Games. They've had a few titles come out. But this does look interesting. And I am a sucker for kind of 4X games. I always have been, especially on PCs. So this certainly looks like one to check out and the miniatures of the world ships are uh, there are five different world ships they're all unique and they look like pretty cool designs so as i mentioned empires of the void 2 i don't know anything about empires of the void 1 but empires of the void 2 is available right now all right moving right along do you like uh time traveling are you sort of a Doctor Who fan or the isn't it uh, on Netflix The Travelers the Canadian show I think it's called The Travelers anyway if you dig that whole time traveling theme and you enjoy dueling games well then my next item might be right up your alley because I've got the dope on Temporal Odyssey from CGC Games and Level 99 Games mm hmm Temporal Odyssey is a game of dueling time travelers. Take that, Doctor! Ha! Open portals to different parts of space and time to draft heroes, monsters, and myths to your cause. Collect powerful artifacts to gain unique abilities from Lovox, the god of time. When defeated, a traveler will turn back time to return to life. The more they meddle, however, the more their own timeline becomes unstable. Each time you collect an artifact or defeat a rival traveler, you reduce their stability. After the opponent's stability has been reduced to zero, defeat them one final time to win. Temporal Odyssey is a unique fusion of battle card games and drafting games that involves set collection, tabletop tactics, and resource management. You will need to balance the many facets of battle in every decision you make during the game. Temporal Odyssey is for 2-4 to four players, ages 12 and up, and plays in approximately 20 to 45 minutes. The game is on the horizon. I do not have an exact release date, though, because I did kind of run across this information secondhand. But I do know Temporal Odyssey will carry an MSRP of $29 and 95 cents. I noticed the, the artwork uh, is pretty unique and it looks as if the games that come from uh, level 99 games all sort of have kind of a, an anime-ish art style to it. 
Uh, normal sized eyes, I have to point out, but there is a very, very anime flavor to the artwork. Looks pretty interesting, and yeah, $30 price tag on it? That's not bad. That seems pretty cool. If you recall on Wednesday, I kidded around about Mark H. Walker, my buddy. Mark H. Walker, who runs uh, Flying Pig Games as well as Tiny Battle Publishing. And I did a review for Old School Tactical Volume 2. Really, really dig it. And I kind of kidded around that all of a sudden there was all this news kind of popping out from both uh, Flying Pig as well as Tiny Battle. And there was a news piece that I had a little bit of hint about but I really didn't have any dope to share with you. But I can say today, I do, because they have a, uh, what I find to be a pretty unique looking new title, which is certainly going to appeal to some of the war gamers out there or folks who like uh, historical strategy games, because you're going to be able to lead a coup. That's right, a coup in Chile 73. I've got the dope. Before the military coup in Chile, we had the idea that military coups happen in banana republics, somewhere in Central America. It would never happen in Chile. Chile was such a solid democracy, and when it happened, it had brutal characteristics. That is a quote from Isabel Allende. Coup d'etats are a messy business. Far from carefully orchestrated military precision, when various factions of a populace overthrow a government, especially when they did so before the age of the internet, operations are strung together in secrecy with limited communication even between like-minded factions. Veteran game designer Brian Train's brand new thriller of a game, Chile 73, brings the secrecy, the suspense, and then the all-out battle of the coup to your game table. In the first portion of the game, two to four players plot secretly to carry out their own plans to gain or maintain rule of Chile, plotting and scrambling to position their forces to best advantage. Once the coup begins, the entire game shifts to open warfare. Loyalties are revealed and players battle to the finish. Civilian and paramilitary units face off against military ground forces aided by tactical air units and transport aircraft. Do you have what it takes to elevate your cause to supremacy? Chile 73 is for two to four players and plays in 150 to 240 minutes. You can score the print edition right now of the game for $19.99, or you can head over to Wargame Vault and get the print and play edition for $6.99. I do have to say that this is a little bit of a departure, as far as I understand, for Tiny Battle Publishing, because for the most part, most of the games that I'm familiar with, and I haven't played a ton of them, mind you, I've only actually uh, played Dead Reckoning. I've actually, everything I've played from Tiny Battle is uh, associated with my good pal, game designer Herman Lutman. So I've played uh, Dead Reckoning, I've played uh, Invaders from Dimension X, and I just reviewed Attack of the 50-Foot Colossi. So a lot of the tiny battle publishing games tend to be solitaire or two-player, and normally you can finish up a game in around an hour, maybe hour and a half. So this is very unique. This is up to four players, and it's got a lot of gameplay packed into it because it's telling us right off the bat, gameplay is going to be at least two to maybe four or five hours. Well, about four hours. Pretty cool. I am intrigued, Mark H. Walker and Brian Train. I am intrigued. <laughs> Anyway, be sure to swing over to the Tiny Battle Publishing website and check it out. All right, my final news piece uh, should be of interest to the role players out there because the deluxe edition of Tunnels and Trolls is making its way back to print from Flying Buffalo Games, and I've got the dope. This is it, the new and improved deluxe Tunnels and Trolls. TNT is the second ever fantasy role-playing game and the easiest to use. 
This book contains everything you need to play the game solo, with the many solo adventures, or with a group of friends. It includes a lot of extra material and descriptions of the worlds played in by the designer and his friends back in the late 1970s. The designer of Tunnels and Trolls is Ken St. Andre, if memory serves correctly. And that would be a name familiar with fans of um, Chaosium, Call of Cthulhu, I believe. If I, Once again, I'm just kind of pulling this off the top of my head. I do believe Ken was involved with Sandy Peterson in the first edition, maybe it was second edition of Call of Cthulhu, an RPG that is near and dear to my heart. Anyway, back to the book. The first 166 pages are the core rules, followed by the elaborations section, which has optional rules and systems you can pick and choose from to add to your TNT games. I said TNT, not D&D, TNT. There's also a 16-page full color section, which includes color maps of Troll World, Kazan, Kosht, and Noor, along with other paintings and maps. There is a 50-page Troll World section that includes descriptions of locations on every major continent and three cities, plus a detailed Troll World timeline. The book also includes a solo adventure that gives you the chance to bring dead characters back to life and a GM adventure on the continent of Zor, plus a detailed weapons glossary and much, much more. In fact, it's over 380 pages. Includes, as I mentioned, the complete solo adventure and the GM group adventure. The hardcover book is going to be available on March 31st with an MSRP of $59.95. All right, so I know folks out there who have followed the gaming gang over the years and who are now tuning into the Daily Dope on a fairly regular basis know that I have been involved in the hobby for uh, <clears throat> a long, long time. And it is true. Tunnels and Trolls is officially the second role-playing game that ever came out, right behind Dungeons and Dragons. And here is an interesting little nugget that I would take a guess that quite a few people out there do not know. The term role-playing game was not coined by TSR when Dungeons and Dragons came out. Oh, no. You would think, oh, yeah, of course. Nope. That phrase was actually coined by Flying Buffalo Games. And the reason behind that is because Flying Buffalo originally started publishing adventures, role-playing game adventures, fantasy adventures. And on these adventures, it would say along the lines of for Dungeons and Dragons. Well, Gary Gygax and his partners over at TSR weren't too keen on Flying Buffalo actually making some money and using their name, so they effectively sent along kind of a cease and desist. I don't know if they officially sent along. Yeah, it involved lawyers and stuff like that. But Flying Buffalo then changed the bit of uh, info on the covers of their adventures to say, along the lines of suitable for any and all fantasy role-playing games. So yes, Flying Buffalo Games coined the term role-playing game. Kind of neat. Kind of interesting. So okay, so I must admit, that that's my last news piece, but I, I want to chat a little bit about Flying Buffalo Games because if you watch the show, if you, if you visit thegaminggang.com, you know I have this kind of odd sort of love, strong dislike, I don't say hate, strong dislike relationship with Steve Jackson Games. So I have to admit that I have a strong, uh, I have a love slash WTF relationship with Flying Buffalo Games, and I'll kind of explain. So I, I, I have the love for Flying Buffalo Games because, yes, I remember picking up the original Tunnels and Trolls book and one of the solo adventures. We're talking, this, we're talking early 80s. I don't recall much about it, though. Uh, and I swear, I've said it before, I wish I had all the stuff, all the games and modules and all these things I've had over the years. I, uh, I could literally... <laughs> 
move the camera probably about 80 feet out and just have an entire wall of the duct tape studio with all of that stuff. I, I kid you not, I have probably over the years owned somewhere in the vicinity of a thousand gaming products. No joke, dead serious. So anyway, so another favorite game of ours that we played in high school was Nuclear War which is a card game from Flying Buffalo Games. It may have actually been possibly their first game that they had published. And I still love that game. Two years ago at Gen Con, uh, my brother Greg, who if you visit the site, you know he does the, the weekly comic book stuff, the comic release news. He comes with to many of the conventions for a few days to be kind of my videographer. And... Usually what we'll do is on, you know, Friday night or Saturday night or whatever, we'll go out, have a couple of beers, and then we'll come, you know, grab a bite to eat, and then we come back to a con and, and play games and that. So we're at the, uh, kind of like the boardroom is at Origins, except it's kind of like a gaming library. It's only, I think, like a four-hour ticket. So anyway, Elliot Miller, my best friend, who I talk about all the time, voiceofv.com, Greg and I are looking around, okay, so what are we going to play? So we pull out Nuclear War. My brother had never played this game. He loved that game. We played three games of Nuclear War. And it was, it, it was funny because it's like, oh, so Greg, uh, do you want, should we play something else? And he's like, no, no, let's do this again. And of course, whenever we play Nuclear War, it's all over the top. It's voices and chanting nuke them till they glow and, and things like that. So I have a, a, a love of that game. In fact, if you go on the gaminggang.com, there is a review of Nuclear War. I want to say Elliot wrote it up. And it, I, we're talking, it's from like 2011. So anyway, so I have this, this real strong nostalgic love for Flying Buffalo games. The WTF comes from Sometimes it's almost as if the company is trying not to make money. The Flying Buffalo Games website, you know, let's go take a peek. Uh, it's atrocious. It really is. You think Steve Jackson Games website is bad? Go to Flying Buffalo Games <laughs> website. It's as if 1995 is calling and they're asking for their website back. It is. It's that bad. Very difficult to navigate. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the information that's on there is re very kind of stream of consciousness, <laughs> sort of. It's just it's bizarre. It's very bizarre. And I understand the, the website's been around forever, and it, it it's the same problem that Steve Jackson Games has too. They've utilized that same uh, content management system for ever. They've got all this material out there, all these posts, all this other stuff. And it's going to be just a bear to recode all that stuff for the modern day. But I sit there and I think, oh my gosh, how much money could Flying Buffalo Games be making? Because Tunnels and Trolls sells. This Tunnels and Trolls is not some under-the-radar, fly-by-night role-playing game. It has a very unique history if people are pumped about the new edition of RuneQuest coming out, people should be pumped about Tunnels and Trolls. It's We're talking, these are historical games. And I got to give huge kudos, too, to Flying Buffalo Games and Rick Loomis, who, from the beginning, has run Flying Buffalo Games. In fact, uh, I want to say the company was pretty much run out of his garage in, I think, Scottsdale, Arizona. Because when I lived out in Arizona, I knew Flying Buffalo was out there. And I had bounced around trying to maybe contact Rick Loomis to see if he'd want to do an interview. And then I thought, I don't know. Does he, why would he want to talk to me, right? <laughs> so anyways, yeah. But um, I got to give a lot of credit to Flying Buffalo Games because there are a lot of role-playing game companies out there who were much larger and much more famous than Flying Buffalo Games, and they went the way of the dodo. TSR is a great example. So I have to give credit, because Flying Buffalo, and I'm sure there's been ups and downs in the hobby for Flying Buffalo Games, but they have weathered the storm, and they have hung around. Like I said, 
I just wish at some point that someone would get a handle on that Flying Buffalo Games website and modernize it because I, I honestly think, I, I think people are probably like me, right? So you're on drive through RPG, for an example, and you're kind of looking around and you see something that's cool and then you say, oh, you know, I'm going to go look at this, this company's website. You actually leave, or maybe you leave drive through up in a browser window, but you leave and you go check out the website. Going to the Flying Buffalo Games website, and there is a Tunnels and Trolls website, don't get me wrong. Still, that should be tweaked as well. But anyone going to the Flying Buffalo Games website, it almost dissuades you from picking up Tunnels and Trolls. <laughs> or even Nuclear War, because I believe there's a 50th anniversary edition. I don't know if it's out yet. I, I'm not positive. See, like I said, it's kind of tough to find out the information on the Flying Buffalo Games website. But I would definitely really, really be looking at that. Uh, I should, actually, after the show, take a peek to see if it's out. I love it. It's a, it's a fun game. It's a blast. All right. So, anyway, I just want to share a little, you know, a little background about uh, Flying Buffalo Games. And, I, you know, I should, one of these days, try to review that game. Thursdays are usually RPGs. I really got to give some love to some of these classic games that are out there. I'll have to look into that. All right, uh, a couple of kind of sort of news pieces. Um, I didn't go through putting together uh, slides and stuff for them. I do want to mention, since I was just talking about RPGs, that uh, do not forget, right now, over at Drive Through RPG the GM's Day sale is going on, and thankfully it lasts more than just a day. And just about everything on the website, over 40,000 products are all 33% off. So as I mentioned yesterday, if you love your GM, or maybe you want to get out of the doghouse with your GM, or maybe you are a GM, definitely swing over there. You've got until the 12th to save 33% on tons and tons of stuff. Unfortunately, Tunnels and Trolls is not uh, one of the the titles that's on sale, which I think is bizarre, seeing almost everything else is. Also keep in mind the uh, Dungeon Masters Guild, this year that sale is going on as well. So it's over on that site too. And as I mentioned when I talk about drive through RPG, if you are swinging over there, stop at thegaminggang.com first, please click on one of our banners. And if you do happen to make a purchase, we get a little portion of that sale. And I always say it, it really goes a long way to helping not only pay for our hosting for the gaming gang, but also to uh, provide me an opportunity to pick up PDFs to review. Say for an example, maybe Tunnels and Trolls, the deluxe edition. All right, the other item I wanted to point out, too, is uh, if you are kind of considering going to Gen Con this year, passes are going to sell out. They are on pace to once again sell out, which I thought was pretty wild. I love Gen Con. Gen Con's my favorite convention. And don't get me wrong, just about every convention I go to is really, really fun. Gen Con just has a special place in my heart. I always have a great time at Gen Con. But last year it sold out, and uh, the assumption was, yeah, it was the 50th Gen Con. There were people who were probably like, oh, yeah, I want to go to the, yeah, I want to go to this historic Gen Con. Couldn't be the first one, so I want to make sure I'm at the 50th one. Ah, This year it's looking the same way. It's looking as if those badges are going to sell out. So if you are considering going to Gen Con this year, and I always recommend it, I can't say enough about it. I know some people have bad experiences at different cons. I never have, you know, knock on wood. But just so you know, you might see that uh, it sells out this year again. So don't wait because uh, you don't want to be sitting there going, yeah, let's do Gen Con and then go to buy a, a, a pass and find out all they've got left are Sunday. You know, what? When all the good exclusives are long gone and it's only half a day of gaming. So anyway, so just want to let you know that. And uh, if people are wondering what conventions I'm covering this year, and I will talk about this a little bit on Monday because I am going to roll out a crowdfunding 
project. Yeah, I am scared to death about it, but I am going to be covering Adepticon, which is here local. C2E2, I've got San Diego Comic Con, I've got Origins, I've got Gen Con. I was invited to Emerald Comic Con, just couldn't fit it into the old budget. And I would love to be able to go to Spiel in Essen this year because I always get an invite, just can never, you know. Yeah, so anyway, so I just wanted to mention that. All right. So real quickly, I got a couple items in the mailbag, but I'm going to talk about those on Monday. So Mark Rivera, uh, who is Blighty Gamer on Twitter and also operates the uh, Board Games and Blighty website. Uh, although I, th I think Mark's taking a little bit of a break because I don't think he's had some posts up in a while, but still cool website to go check out. Uh, he's been tweeting a bit lately about how the tabletop gaming industry and and more precisely board gaming wants to be more inclusive but the pricing is getting to the point where they're pricing a lot of people out of the hobby and it's it's sort of and i know there's the like the the haves have nots kind of thing going on and i sort of look at it in, in two different ways right on one hand yes i'd love to have a lamborghini but i can't afford a lamborghini Am I going to be upset that I can't have that Lamborghini? No. But then again, I'm old school. I don't have that whole thought process of, I, I exist, thus I deserve. I don't. So on, on one hand, I think, well, okay. But giving credit to Mark, and, and Mark is on the money, there are a lot of games out there that we're seeing that the, the price points are just constantly going up and up and up and up. And a lot of companies are including miniatures in games that the game doesn't really need miniatures. There's really no call for the miniatures. That's why I'm kind of using a term uh, miniature driven games. I guess a great example would be uh, the uh, Gotham City Chronicles, the Batman game that's up from Monolith. And don't get me wrong, those miniatures look really sweet. I especially like there's a sculpt from The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. It's like, wow, that is like spot on from the cover of the comic. Graphic novel, I should say. But uh, it's a $140 game. Now, granted, there are miniatures, and the miniatures do look cool. But looking at how the game plays, supposedly, you don't really need the miniatures. They could have been standees or counters or what have you to have brought this down. And I'm not just talking about games that include miniatures. I'm seeing this with a lot of companies where you would think, looking at what the components are, that the game should probably price out maybe $30, $40. And then you look and it's got an MSRP of 80 bucks. Something has got to give. And I know there is discussion of a lot of counterfeit games floating around. There are people who are scanning games and components and kind of putting those out there online. Then you can just print and play your own version of the game or copy of the game. I don't dig that. I, I don't dig that at all. But something is going to have to give because it is going to get to the point where... because. Yeah, we're, you know, if you're a gamer, you want more games. A lot of people are talking about, you know, they're starting to call games out of their collection as opposed to always being on the lookout to pick up new stuff. And of course, the market is somewhat flooded with titles too. So it becomes, it'll, it becomes a little bit more difficult to kind of sort through what's going to be good, what's not going to be good. And that is one of, one of the reasons why it's important that we have more people out there covering the hobby. I don't look at other people doing reviews and doing news and all this other stuff as competition. It's good for the consumer when you get all these different opinions out there and then that way you can kind of piece together, well, yes, that's a game that fits my needs or that's my family's going to like that. My gaming gang's going to dig that. So, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know. So some folks may have noticed that I am kind of throwing in a bit of a
but I have seen you can get it online someplace for as low as whatever. You can expect me to do much more of that. Uh, I do not operate as someone who is just, yeah, throw me a sell sheet. I've put it out there in the news as if well, everything's all equal, because it's not. All right, so I just, I just wanted to mention that, because there is a lot of rumbling, especially with the board gamers out there, that, uh, yeah, something's got to give with the pricing, because it's, uh, it's getting to the point where people are getting priced out of the hobby. They really, really are. Okay, so enough of my pontificating and that. Ah, the news and stuff took up about a half hour. So I am going to review Songbirds, which came out originally in 2016. Now, the edition I've got here is from, I believe, Essen this past year. So this edition is actually from Homo Sapiens Lab. Kind of an oddball name for a company, right? I think, I think they're Taiwanese. I think, I'm not positive. I think they are a Taiwanese game. So this is not available yet. It is coming March 20th to Kickstarter because Daily Magic Games and Homo, Sapien La Homo Sapiens Lab are teaming up to bring this to Kickstarter. It's going to be a short Kickstarter. I believe it's only 15 days. And Songbirds is for one to four players, ages eight and up, and it plays in about 20 minutes. Now, I know there are folks out there who are longtime followers of the gaming gang, and the first thing they're going to say is, wait a second, Jeff, you don't review Kickstarter projects. That is not true. And I inform anyone who asks me, hey, you know, you want to take a look at our Kickstarter and things like that. I will do a preview of a game. I only do a review if what I receive is just about exactly what a backer on the Kickstarter would receive once the game is published. I can tell you with pretty good certainty that there might be some tweaks, maybe to the components, highly doubt to the artwork or anything like that. But what I am going to show you and what I'm going to review is pretty much what you're going to get from Daily Magic Games as well as Homo Sapiens Lab. Although I will admit, I am taking a guess, probably not the same uh, languages that the rules are in. So I'm going to switch over to the other camera here. And I do want to point out that uh, you may actually see this float around outside of this episode because Daily Magic Games might use this uh, for their Kickstarter. Don't know. I have no idea. They may sit there and say, yeah, this guy talks too much. And, you know, it's only a 20-minute game, and he's talked about it for a half hour. What's wrong with this character? Don't know. All right, so let's switch on over. All right, what's going on? Come on. There we go. First of all, let me grab a sip here. Okay, so the premise of Songbirds is that uh, there's kind of a contest going on in the forest, right? So you've got all these different birds, and all these birds are trying to, they're trying to be the, the most impressive. This was originally when it first came out. I want to say the name of this game was Bird Fight. So... Uh, kudos <laughs> to change the name because it is for ages eight and up. Bird fight just seems a little odd, but it, it's still it's it was still I believe the same premise where there's kind of this this contest and all the all the birds in the forest, all the songbirds in the forest are trying to be the loudest and most impressive. So within the box. And as you can see, it's a pretty small box. And I'm eventually going to zoom out a little bit because this game actually takes up some space on your table. So pretty uh, small footprint box here. Very easily toss it in a, uh, your backpack, purse, glove compartment. I don't have baggy pockets in my pants, but I guess if you do, you can probably slide it right into a pocket. Very, very easily portable. 
So within this edition, there are rules in English, there are rules in Japanese, and I, I, I gotta be honest, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's maybe it's Taiwanese. It doesn't look like Chinese. I don't know. I am not that bright to tell you what language these two other rule sheets are, but I can tell you, I do recognize English. So the rules are very, very simple. This game takes probably about three minutes to explain, if even that. So we see the story of the songbirds. It says, with the rising sun, the songbirds sing. They call to their mates and declare their territory. In this bountiful forest, only the loudest songbirds singing the most beautiful songs will claim the trees with the ripest berries and prime nesting spots. Gives you a little breakdown of the components, an overview, how to set up the game, gameplay, end of game, and scoring. There is uh, a certain rule for four player games. There's also a solo variant, as well as a cooperative variant. And it talks about the end game is scoring for the solo and co op, and the end game and scoring for two, three. Uh, two or three players. I don't know. Scoring is the same for four players, too. So pretty easy. Jump right on into this. So you're going to have a deck of songbird cards. And I have to say, I found the artwork on these cards as the little white songbird goes zipping off. I found... Okay, it, okay maybe coming from me, this is going to sound kind of odd. Because it's not as if... I, you know, you're used to hearing me use these words. I found the artwork on these cards to be charming and sweet. It really, it really is. These birds are, I love the artwork. I think the artwork is just so nicely done. We're going to take a look through some of these. And as we take a look at some of these cards, you're going to see that the birds are broken up effectively into four suits. So you've got white, green, blue, and red. Although the red birds are actually brown. So I'm talking about the numbers up here. And you will also see that each of these cards are going to be numbered from one through seven. There we go. There's a seven right there. So here's an interesting thing about these cards too is the higher numbers, it's almost as if it's kind of, you're kind of looking at the lifespan of the bird. I thought that was kind of a cool little extra. So I'll give you an example, right? So we're looking at the one. Well, the one here, it's a little bird. A little bird, young bird. Then when we get to like a seven, so here we've got the seven card for this white bird. Oh, look, oh, it's got an egg going to the nest. Very, very sweet. Like the six is sort of like, oh, look, I found a mate. I just can't get over how, how cool this artwork is. And for players who would happen to be colorblind, if you notice, there's the little icons underneath the numbers so that's going to help will help tremendously we've got a deck of these cards you've also got these berry tokens which are used for scoring which you kind of see it's right on the side of the screen right now and they're going to have various different numbers on them these are used for scoring and you'll actually kind of shuffle them up and then you're going to lay them out on the table, number side down, to start. So you don't know exactly what value each of these rows that you're going to see in just a moment are going to have. Then we also have a couple of scoring cards here. And we see, as I mentioned, there are the four different suits, four different colors of birds. So we've got the green, the blue, the red, as well as the white. So this is gonna stay, these are gonna stay off to the side because you're gonna use this at the end for the scoring. 
There's also an owl card. Interestingly enough, this owl card is included in the game. In the English language rules, there's really no mention of what, what is this owl card? What does this owl card do? But there is an owl card that tells you, oh, okay, that's what you use the owl for. And the owl can actually be used as a variant, kind of a little bit of a variant. I found it really cool. I really like the owl card. Plus, once again, that's some pretty cool art. There's also a crow card, which is utilized in a four player game. And I will talk about this in just a moment. It's two sided. So one, we'll see, see we've got the negative two, four, five, negative three, if we go clockwise around the card. Then there's also a different version on the other side where it's just minus four, minus four. And I'll explain how this works in just a bit. We weren't so keen on this Raven card and I'll explain why after I get into all of this. Then we're also gonna have some tokens here and these are nice, thick. These aren't just uh, cardboard, nice chunky tokens. And these are actually used with that Raven card, or I'm sorry, Crow card, because the Crow actually will um, subtract from what you've got set up. All right, so I'm gonna reach up here and I am gonna zoom on out. And I know none of this is all straight. So keep in mind, if you watch the show, you do know that uh, that you are looking at uh, pretty much space is at a premium here. So I'm going to do my best to show this off. I know some of the cards are gonna end up overlapping vertically, but you'll get an idea. Okay, so what you're gonna do is you've got these berry tokens. Remember I mentioned you put them all face down, or I should say number side down. So you're gonna create a grid. So you're looking at five by five. So it's gonna go five cards horizontally, five cards vertically. You're going to begin, depending on the number of players. So let's say we're playing a two player game, all right? So each of the players are going to receive, why did I just deal it like that? Start talking. <laughs> each of the two players is going to receive 13 cards. You're gonna have one card left over and you're gonna leave that out. Oh, wait a second, did I not count these up right? That would be me, right? One, two, three, four, five. I thought there's only one left over with a two player game. Maybe I'm wrong. Nope. All right, Jeff. You're just a doofus. All right, so you're going to remove each of the players is going to get 13 cards. In a three-player game, each, each player is going to get nine cards. And then, of course, a four-player game. So the whole premise, and this is really simple. So the whole premise is you're going to fill the forest with your songbirds. And the first songbird, and you can determine who the first player is. Uh, if I remember correctly in the rules, it says, all right, whoever won the last game uh, goes first. You're going to take your card. The first card is going to go in the center. So you're going to go, all right, boom. So you see, okay, so it's a third token down, third token over. That's the center. So that's the first player. The next player is going to place a songbird card. And when they place the card, it must connect to a card that's already on the table. So in this situation, and it can be diagonally as well. So you've got vertical, horizontal, diagonal. And oh, almost forgot, before you start dropping your songbirds out there, you are gonna flip over these berry tokens. And we see 
We've got 8, 15, 12, 7, 5, 12, 6, 10, 7, 6. These are used for scoring at the end of the game. So you're going to, 15 is scored this way. 10 is scored this way. All right, so the next player had to drop a card down. And of course, you're going to look at your cards. So the whole premise of the game is that you want to have the highest value of songbirds in a row to win that row. But here's the trick. The last card that you have in your hand is going to be the suit of birds that you will score points from. I was like, what? <laughs> yep. So as you're sitting there and let's say, oh, well, you know, I've got this, this row of green and I've got, wow, I've got all these, my numbers are blowing everybody else out of the water uh, for my green birds here. Well, yeah, great. But if you misplay and the last card in your hand is a blue bird, those green birds are not going to help you at all because you're only going to score for the blue birds. So it is your preferred songbird. First time we played, <coughs> I won't name any names, the first time we played, someone actually did that. Someone actually was, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, okay, yes. And then at the end of the game, they had, they had played the card that they had meant to hold on to as the last card and kind of went up in smoke. All right, so you're going to sit there and you're going to end up putting the cards out. And eventually what you're going to have, and I can actually, coming across is fine. It's the... It's the vertical cards that I've got a, an issue trying to squeeze all these cards in. So eventually what you'll do is you'll be playing. The forest is going to fill up with different cards. I'm going to have to overlap a little bit. You get the premise, though. It's a grid. You're not actually overlapping cards. All right, so eventually you're going to get to the point where you've got the forest filled in with all the various different birds. The last card that you got in your hand, right, each player is going to say, okay, well, let's say for an example, these are the two players. One is red, one is white. Okay, well, excellent. So we're going to score these, and this is where these scoring cards are going to come into play. So I'm going to put those right over here. So you'd say, okay, so let's look at this row here. So red, we've got 12, right? Seven and five, that's 12. Five for blue, two for white. The red bird is gonna score those eight points. Then we take a look here. Okay, the big 15 point row, right? We're gonna take a look at the 15 point row. And here we've got the green Bird has nine, white seven, blue seven, red three. So the green bird would score the 15. Now we're gonna look at this row here. Got nine, well, it looks like nine's gonna take it. Green is gonna get that too, wow. Looking good for green. Take a look at this row. 11 for blue, yep, nobody's gonna come close. Blue's gonna get that. Let me take over here, take a look here. Uh, wow, that's pretty close, right? Got six, five, four, three. Looks like green's gonna take this one too. Now, one thing that you'll see, and I thought this was kind of a little interesting twist too, is if you have two bird colors, so let's say for an example, red and blue, and they both are the same, they both match. So let's say they both have seven. So their birds total seven in that row. They actually cancel each other out and whatever color is left scores the points. But that was kind of a, a neat little wrinkle. All right, once again, we're gonna look across here. Well, white's got uh, 10, nobody else has 10. 12 to white. We look across here. Wow, what? green's is walking away with everything around here. And we're gonna take a look here. Red's got 11, so red's gonna get the 10. 
Take a peek down here. Uh, well, looks like Blue's got the six, so Blue's going to take seven. And then along here, we've got Green steals this one too, so six. So if you had saved a green card in your hand, you would be scoring up all these points. That would be your final total, right? 12, 24, 39. Green is a big winner. As I said, super, super easy to explain how to play this game. It takes three minutes, four minutes. Anyway, but there are some cool wrinkles. So let's say for an example, the two of the players, three of the players, four of the players, it is possible, highly unlikely, but it is possible that you'll have multiple players with the same color bird. I mean, it, it is within the realm of possibility that all four players decide they're saving the same color bird be pretty bizarre and I don't think the people playing it would have actually been trying to look at the strategies to this game but it is possible in a case where more than one player has the same color bird same faction I guess we'll say the same same bird suit what you'll do is you'll actually add this the number on the card to the total score whoever's got the highest wins Easy peasy. Really nicely done. Okay, so now we've got the owl. And the owl has the same backing as all the other cards. The owl can be included in the deck. So a player could get the owl card. And the owl card is interesting because the owl card can be played on a spot and it actually chases that bird away. So the owl ends up taking that spot and the player who played the owl gets to move this bird to another spot. It's a little bit of a, a take that mechanic. There's only one owl, so only one person is going to get this owl. But it's a nice way to kind of throw a wrench in somebody's plans or to, you know, make sure that you... Uh, secure that row because that row's got the 15 points in it and maybe you're tied with somebody else and you decide okay all right I'm gonna lay down the owl now of course you do not want the owl to be the last card in your hand because the owl has a score of zero so yes you would get nothing if you somehow forget to play the owl card and it's your last card in your hand. Okay, so then with the four player game, you've got the crow. And the crow will actually be placed in the middle of the table. So you would actually have rows that look like this. So the way it's this way I have it kind of a more difficult way. So in the row going above, it's going to be a minus two to the color that has the most. So anything above the crow up this way is going to be minus two. Anything this way is minus four. Down this way, it's minus five. Down this way, it's minus three. There is the option to use the other side that's just minus four this way, minus four this way. I have to be honest, we didn't necessarily care for the, the crow aspect of the game. Just seemed to add a little more busy work to the design. Uh, eh, I don't know. I mean, some people will dig it, some people won't. But to me, it kind of threw off a little bit of the uh, the serenity of the game, kind of, you know, it's real nice, very pleasant game. I will admit that it is possible to see a little bit of analysis paralysis in this, which you would 
not really expect, right? And it usually sets in as the grid is filling out, right? So it's getting to the point where let's move that out. We're, let's say you're about halfway through. There's still, you know, plenty of spaces for you to drop your songbird card. But all of a sudden it's sort of like, oh, okay. So remember, you've got a whole hand of cards. And you're like, well, um, okay. So I, do I put it in this row or do I put it over here? Uh, hmm. It can happen. I mean, this isn't an overly complex game or anything along that those lines, but it can get to the point where you're sort of like, ooh, do I do I want to put that card there? Huh? Not horrible, uh, but I mean, it it can happen. It it can happen. So that, in a nutshell, is really songbirds. It is a, I, like I said before, I love the artwork on these cards. The card stock is really nice. Nice card stock. Of course, as I always say, any card game that you're going to play a lot of or a game that's got cards, yeah, go spend a couple of bucks. Even if you get penny sleeves, sleeve your cards. So all in all, this is a lot of fun. It is especially good for kids. It says ages eight and up. I leave it to the folks out there. You know how well your children can catch on to certain games and things like that. You might go a little bit younger. You might skew a little bit younger than eight. But to me, eight and up seems about fair. 20 minute playtime. That's about right. If you're taking into account that you might see some of the players kind of ponder a little bit during their moves on where they want to put the next songbird down. So, uh, all the only knock I've got about the game, and it's a little knock, it's not a huge knock. We just didn't care for the crow. It just, and it, but, and the thing is the rules say that if you're playing four players, you have to use the crow. Yeah. To us, it, it just seemed to change the dynamic of the game where it just, you know, uh, plus I was playing with some some kids who uh, maybe aren't the, the greatest math whizzes around. I'm not saying that they can't count, but I am saying that it just threw in a little more. That's where we saw more of that analysis paralysis pop up is when we were using that crow card. All right, so. Obviously, Songbirds is not going to be the sort of game that somebody who <laughs> sits there and they say, oh, well, you know, I only play post-World War II tactical combat games. Obviously, Songbirds isn't even going to be on your radar. But the way I look at Songbirds, I think it's a, an excellent game. And People who follow the gaming gang know I don't use the word filler. I don't say filler games because I have a negative connotation with filler. To me, filler goes in ground beef at fast food places. Filler is not good for you. So for me, I look at Songbirds as a nice kind of uh, wind up, wind down kind of game. You wind up your night of gaming with it. You might wind down your night of gaming with it. Really, really pleasant game. Personally, and I know some people out there still have not wrapped their head around the numeric scores that I give on a 1 to 10. Some people are kind of thrown off where I might give like a family game uh, a high score and then I give a game that's got like all these moving parts and everything else the same kind of score. And I have to sit there and say, well, you got to realize when I'm scoring a game, when I'm giving it a review score, I'm looking at a few different things. Who is the audience? What does this game seem like it sets out to accomplish? Does it pull that off? Is it engaging? And mainly, would I want to play this again? Or, you know, after the three times we play something to review it, is this going to come off my shelf? And I can certainly say, yes, Songbirds is certainly a game that would come off my shelf. 
obviously I'm not going to pull it out for people who are into big, heavy strategy games, no. But I'll tell you what I think this is a perfect fit for. And I might be going out on a limb, but there are lots of folks out there, couples, who play games. This, this plays really well as a two-player game. It's a lot of fun. And give a great example. So for an example, let's say you've got a couple, right? And they play games. They play, yeah, maybe a little lighter games. And they have friends who come over and maybe you have dinner and you have a couple glasses of wine and you're kind of kicking back. And your friends aren't really gamers like you folks are. This is a perfect game to take out with some non-gaming friends and enjoy a nice bottle of wine or adult beverage and just unwind. I love the fact that it's a game where, yes, I mentioned there could be some analysis paralysis, but it really is a game that you can kind of chat while you're playing it. Just kind of have a conversation going very social, very, oh, oh okay, oh, I'm going to put that there, and oh, it's not a game where you necessarily have to sit there and be like completely spending like 10 minutes just running every single option through your head. No, not at all. You could if you want, if you're like, wow, I don't know where to put this songbird. But I, I love the fact that this is a nice social game you could easily play while you're chatting away with friends over, yeah, nice Nice bottle of white. So I actually give Songbirds an 8.4 out of 10. I think it really does accomplish what it sets out to do. The only knock I had is really we didn't care for that crow. Which I honestly think, now we didn't play around with it, but I honestly think utilizing the owl card you may not necessarily have to use the crow. I don't know. I didn't dig that far deep into Songbirds to find out. Now, as I mentioned, this is not available yet. It is coming to Kickstarter on March 20th from Homo Sapiens Lab and Daily Magic Games. I believe there's going to be uh, some, like a, a special card or something like that. Now, that special card could be the owl. Because as I mentioned, the owl, at least I didn't see it, the owl isn't discussed in the little rules page. So that might be it. I, I think they've got a few different little maybe stretch goals. But I can tell you that really not much is going to change. I mean, if this was the edition, and I believe this is the edition that was already on sale in 2017, this is definitely one to take a look at. As I mentioned, it's not on Kickstarter yet. I do not have any sort of pledge level information. I would say this is a game that I would normally think should carry about an MSRP of $20. Now that might mean that the Kickstarter, you might be able to secure the game for maybe say 15 to 17. I do not know. That is certainly completely just my observation, just floating a few things out there. I do not have all the dope about Songbirds from Daily Magic Games. When I do know, and of course when it launches, I will talk about it on the show as well have, as have a news piece up as well. All right, so there you have it. Another week in the books, five reviews in a row. All week long there was a review. That was pretty wild. I don't believe I have ever even written reviews, uh, done five days of reviews that said <laughs> I got more reviews coming next week so on Monday I'm still a little up in the air what I'm going to do on Monday um, Monday I think what I'm going to do is I am going to review Evolution this is the latest edition of Evolution from North Star Games so uh, keep an eye out for that on Monday Tuesday, I think, is the one that I'll have to um, kind of bounce around. Maybe I'll do a review of the agents from Ninja Division. Haven't played it enough to, but I'm going to do that over the weekend. On Wednesday, it is at any cost. Yes, another Herman Lettman design. And from GMT, we're 
talking double dose of goodness, folks. So I will be doing uh, an unboxing of, at any cost, Mets uh, 1870. Yep, 1870. Second, I forgot the year. On Thursday, I'm either going to do an RPG review or I will do a review of Epic Card Game. And then on next Friday's show, uh, I might do Sakura, the new Osprey uh, Games title. I might do a review of that because we, we only played once. Uh, so that's another game that I've got on the horizon for this weekend. All right, so there you have it. That is it for today's show. Wow, actually a little longer than I thought it would be. Uh, eh, I pontificate about games and that. Sorry if you were expecting, yeah, Jeff's going to talk about songbirds for five minutes. No, it's not my style. But anyway, uh, I know there's some really bad weather on the West Coast. They got that nor'easter coming in, and it's not the Alexa, so uh, Billy Joel's not going to be able to help you out with that. So be very careful out there if you're on the East Coast. They are issuing warnings that you know, it could be life or death with uh, that bomb cyclone thing. So be careful. The West Coast is getting some storms too. So it, wherever you live, have a safe weekend. Have a great weekend. Have a lot of fun, but also have a very, very safe weekend because that's the most important thing. I want you to be able to come back on Monday and say, hey, Jeff, what's cooking? All right, once again, I am Jeff McAleer, and when you aren't watching The Daily Dope, be sure to go over to thegaminggang.com for the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. I'm going to throw out one last reference to Dr. Seuss and say, today was good, today was fun, tomorrow is another one. I'll be back on Monday, gang. Thanks for watching.